Let's turn on your notes and your Bibles tonight to Joshua chapter 3. <clears throat> I'm almost over this little, little nagging uh, cold thing I've had, but every once in a while there's a little cough here, so excuse me and you know what, uh, ahead of time if, if any of those come up. But Joshua 3, and, and Lord willing, we're going to look at Joshua 3 and 4 tonight. And I think these go together quite well. And uh, definitely a little faster pace than when we were there in Revelation. And so let's just do a little quick kind of recap of those first two chapters uh, because we're still, um, you know, at, on that, the, the east of the Jordan River. Uh, we're going to see the crossing over that tonight. And then pretty soon there are going to, a couple more chapters, they head into Jericho. And so I think this is a noteworthy place to hit chapter one and two again. And as we, you know, get deeper into it, the, the recap won't go back so far. It will be a lot more vague. But um, remember there in Joshua, and we know Moses. And I love it because it says twice, the Lord's servant, the servant of the Lord. Has so many titles that Moses could have. But um, you know what? I don't think it's by chance the Lord says the servant of the Lord. And I don't think there's any more of a higher title than that a servant of the Lord. Lord, help us to abound in that. He had passed away, and we know from, um, you know, at Deuteronomy that that happened there in Moab, on Mount Nebo, and the Lord buried him, which is pretty amazing, and they don't know where he's buried to this day, and we kind of talked about that, but he had passed away, and so the Lord now turned to Joshua, his assistant, who is also called the servant of the Lord, and we get an insight there. Look at if you want to be used by the Lord to lead, it always starts by serving and serving the Lord and being yielded to the Lord. And really, you know, how can you really lead anyone in the Lord if you're not following the Lord yourself and serving the Lord yourself? We'll have more of that reiterated in these chapters tonight. There's a lot in these chapters about leading and following and, um, you know, what, heeding God's commands and the blessing of that for sure. A lot of insights. And as we saw last week, they had... Previously, you know, what Moses was leading Israel when they had come out of Egypt, God had told them to go into this land of milk and honey, this land of Canaan that had been promised to Abraham over 400 years earlier. And remember, they sent the spies in and they came back with a bad report, except Joshua and Caleb. And as a result of abhorring, we saw Sunday there in our psalm, they abhorred the word of the Lord, they despised it. And instead, they listened to this bad report that, you know, it appealed more to the flesh and brought security to the flesh because there's giants in the land and they can't take us. But that didn't bring as much security as if they would have just trusted in the Lord. Because I'll tell you, 40 years in a land of milk and honey with houses already built and wells already dug and vineyards already planted sounds a whole lot better than 40 years in a wilderness, does it not? But you know what? It kept them out there. And so that 40 years has passed. That first generation that doubted, the last one had passed because the Lord said, when you pass, this younger generation, they're going to go in. And, and next week, we'll see how they differentiated between the younger and the older generation. And God told Joshua, listen, it's time to be strong and courageous. Three times he tells them in the first chapter, be strong and courageous. And he says, I am with you and I'm giving you the land. So if you know God's with you and he's going before you and you are going to, to, to walk in what belongs to us and it's a matter of just walking in it, there's no reason not to be strong and courageous. And yet our flesh comes against that, does it not? It wants us to doubt the word of the Lord. We have a tendency, we get our eyes off the Lord to lean on our own understanding. Oh, but there's giants in the land. But let's remember we serve the giant God. And his words are, and his promises, they're yes and amen. <clears throat> and his word is true. And in all those times, he says, be strong and courageous. He, he's not just saying that like, hey, you know what? Um, you know what? Don't worry, be happy. You know, just, just throwing that out there. Or, you know what? Hey, you know what? Chin up and so forth. With, with you know, if you, if you don't know the Lord, there, there might not be reason to have chin up. It might be, you know what? You need to be full of fear. And you know what? Don't worry, be happy. If you don't know the Lord, you should be worried and concerned about your eternal soul. But seeing the Lord, when he says be strong and courageous, there's substance in that because God's going before us. It's not be strong and courageous in yourself. It's not you can do it. It's like I'm going before you. 
And it's reiterated multiple times in that first chapter. And then remember, Gad and Reuben and the half-tribe of Manasseh had settled east of the Jordan. And then they're addressed and they're told, listen, you, when you were given this land, were told you need to go in with these other tribes when you go across the Jordan to take the land God's giving to you. And I love it because they say, we're ready to go. We'll touch on them again tonight. And then they say to, to Joshua, we're ready to follow but you know what? We just ask you to be strong and courageous. And as you follow the Lord, we're gonna follow you. And absolutely, it makes it easy to follow when those who you're following are following to the Lord, following the Lord, then you're all going in the same direction. And it's the Lord's desire for that in every home. It's his desire for that in every local fellowship that we're going in the same direction, following after the Lord. Well, we saw last week in chapter two, that Joshua sends spies into the land. And instead of spending 12 like before, he sends two. We talked a little bit about that. He sent two men of God. And two men of God is better than two men of God and 10 carnal men, 10 men that doubt the Lord and so forth. And he said, I only need two guys now. And it proved they were men of God because we saw them moving by faith when they go there into the first city, Jericho, to spy it out. And remember, they end up at Rahab, and at this point, her name is Rahab the harlot's house. And we talked about how it wouldn't seem strange for men to go into that home. They weren't there, obviously, to participate, but in wisdom, they said, look, it, this is somewhere we can go and it won't look as suspicious to a really far, for a fallen land that's being judged because of their gross immorality. But it wasn't by chance that they went in there. And we talked about how we plan our ways, but the Lord directs our steps. And I've been thinking about that this week. You know what? How many times do we have a day plan or we're gonna go to such and such a place and you get a little hiccup and everything changes in your plans? And you, you're like, oh, I didn't plan this today. Look at we plan our ways, but God directs our steps. And really in everywhere we go, we should be looking for those opportunities to shine for the Lord. And hopefully it's just something that comes forth from us as we're abiding in the Lord. But there's no... There, you know, there, there, it, it, with, the Lord, with the Lord and following the Lord, it's not about luck or happenstance. God directs and leads our steps. Sometimes he directs our steps to correct us, right? And sometimes he directs our steps to, to, to take us through a trial more of a, of a perfection. Other times he just directs our steps, I think just in the necessities of life and making provisions for us. And sometimes he'll direct our steps. And again, it's not limited to this, to somewhere we're gonna be a witness, and he wants us to be in this place for this person in particular and share the Lord. And, and this woman here, it was not by chance they ended up in her home. Now, she had heard, and even those in Jericho and those west of the Jordan, they had heard about the mighty things God had done through Israel, how he had delivered them from Egypt 40 years earlier, how he split the Red Sea, and how he had drowned the Egyptian army. And this wasn't, this wasn't like folklore. This wasn't, wasn't like, well, we heard it. And so, you know what? It's just fairy tales or Greek mythology. They knew this as factual history. You know, if we go back 40 years and we know our history, there's not a lot of that's doubted. And I know, you know what? Some of that's even distorted, but major events that happened. No one doubts that 9-11 happened, right? People can, you know what? debate, you know, what, who was behind all of that and so forth, but no one doubts it happened. Look at this is the same way that was. No one doubted. Everyone knew God had delivered Israel out of Egypt, that God had split that Red Sea and God had washed away the Egyptian army. They also knew there uh, west of the Jordan in Canaan that God had given them victory over Og and Shion, these mighty kings. And, and she says, our hearts melted when we hear this all our strength was taken from us and God's heart melted Rahab. And she probably heard this, you know, at, at some point as a child or in her adolescence, we don't know exactly how she, old she is here, probably early 20s, maybe even a late teenager. Because if you look at the timeline, the book of Ruth happens kind of in the middle of Judges and that's how you get Boaz, uh, you know, coming for her. And we talked about it last week. I'm getting ahead of myself a bit. Her being in the genealogy of Christ. And so she had Boaz as, as a young, as an older woman, but somewhere as a kid, she heard of this and it planted a seed in her. 
And this has been on my heart a lot. I talked about, a lot about it last week, and I thought a lot about it on Friday night when we had all those kids coming through here and ministering. And when I was up sitting back here, and we had a fence, and I was, I was Uncle Rat, and we were sharing the gospel in that skit, I was praying, Lord, there might be a little Rahab here tonight. This might be the first time she hears about the Lord. And I know this Rahab, this, this Rahab, because she said, I heard about it. It planted a mighty seed in her heart. And she knew that God was the God of heaven. And no doubt she recognized that, you know what, the way we live here is wrong. And most likely, if she was a harlot, she was probably being raised in a house of prostitution herself. And in that land, they weren't ashamed of their sin anymore. It was just kind of another job. You know, you got a blacksmith, you got a carpenter, you got a harlot. They looked at it as the same. The the shame wasn't there. But what she did know is that the way they lived was wrong and judgment was coming. And there was a yearning in her. And again, it's just heavy on my heart. You know, there's people out there and sharing the gospel with them, they might not get saved at that point. But us standing out and sharing the Lord or even having, you know, at harvest parties and vacation Bible schools and, you know, and even pancake Sundays where people will bring their friends or even if they just happen to be here staying at someone's night, at someone's house on a Wednesday night or whatever. I, I, I just know this. I never take any service for granted. I don't ever want to take any service for granted because that might be the night that that little girl or boy comes in and, and they're grabbed by the Lord. And it might be 20 years later that they come to the Lord, but I, I just, and I shared a little bit last week and I just feel led to share it again. We've been talking about reminders and reiterating things. I just look at my life and I, I, can, I can point out like a six to a half a dozen to a dozen times where I know the Lord met me right there. And even in all the dirtiness and the filthiness of what he brought me out of, there was something about that, and most of it, not all of it, but most of it was just someone being obedient to the Lord. And it was just a little seed or a little water or, you know, later on, you know, when I, I got my later teens and early 20s, it was a few rebukes that were powerful that took faith for them to give me that rebuke. And, and just remember that in this, and Lord, help us to remember that throughout our day. Help us to remember that in ministry. Maybe you're one of our Sunday school teachers and you know, it's, it's easy in that just to kind of get in the routine and, and you know, maybe even read your curriculum that morning and you go in there and God can bless that. But I can't encourage you enough to be praying for those kids all week. I'd be praying, Lord, we might have that kid here this week that it's the only time they're ever gonna come in. And Lord, I want to be, God, not just sharing, but I, I want the spirit of God to be working through me so my words don't fall on the ground. I want that kid to look in my eyes and see the light of the Lord. I want them to be impressed that if they never come back again as a child, what they got here just sticks and resonates in them. And again, the word has to be taught in that as well. But I'll tell you, a lot of that also has to do with the messenger and with our interaction and and people seeing our love for the Lord and so forth. Aren't we the, we're, we're called the salt of the earth and a city set upon a hill to be a light. And so to be that, we got to be, again, walking in, in a communion with him. And so she was met through that report. I know the Lord meets people through reports as well and through our lives. And so they got there and she understood who they were. And she took that great step of faith to hide them. And we read in Hebrews and James in the New Testament, it talks about her faith and hiding them and, you know, and in lodging them. And it wasn't any deceitful thing. It was a great step of faith. And remember, it says, Rahab the harlot did that. But praise God, you go to to Matthew and you see the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And this is just amazing. And we'll probably talk more about it later in in Joshua because I want to talk more about it. I think it's worthy of it. How does this this harlot on, on, you know, and in Jericho where the walls fell in, and everyone died except her and those in her house. How in the world does she get in the genealogy of Jesus Christ? It's amazing. It's awesome. Uh, you know what? She, she, she has a fear of God. She, she, she hides these men out of faith, which showed her faith in the Lord. Because that would have cost her her life. If they found those men in that home, she's dead and probably her whole family's dead. They're all dead. 
And she hides them. And then, you know what? She tells them where to go and how to get out. And she says, look it, I've spared you. You got to spare me. And it shows why these two spies were men of God, because they said, we'll honor that. Everyone in your house, when we come in, will be saved. You just have to put this scarlet thre- thread, you know, in this blood colored, you know, cord in your window. And as soon as they left or went to hide, she put it in right then. And, you know, beautifully, they end up getting out. And then in Joshua, it's there in your notes, uh, 2, 23, they come to Joshua. They told them everything that happened. <clears throat> they told them, hey, their, their hearts are melting over there. And we talked about that too, how many times we're like, oh, that old enemy, you know, and there's so many Christians and we need to be ready for a spiritual warfare. But, you know, there's certain people, anything come, hey, how you doing? Oh, that enemy, oh, the old devil, you know, every time. And it's kind of like, oh, yeah, you know, like there's this, this like Star Wars thing, the force, yin, yang, equal powers going on. And we need to be aware. But here's the thing you need to know when you walk by faith and trust in the Lord, the enemy's heart melts. And know this as well. When you fear the enemy, you're worshiping the enemy because we're called to fear God. I, I'm, I'm convinced one of the reasons why Satan loves horror movies and Halloween and, and those types of things and people getting frightened and people like that because they get endorphins released and it, it, it's a type of drug. But when that fear is put in them of those things and outside of the Lord, you should be afraid. It's a type of reverence to the devil. And again, we don't downplay the devil in spiritual warfare. It's a real thing. But you need to know when you walk by faith and you trust in the Lord, it disarms the enemy at so many terms. And his, his, he, he, he melts with fear that we would walk by faith. That's why Paul prayed for those in Ephesus, that they would know the might and the power that God has towards those who believe in him. It goes along with this, be strong and be courageous because the Lord's going before us and so forth. And so that's reported there to Joshua. And he says there in verse 24, truly the Lord has delivered all the land <clears throat> to our hands for indeed all the inhabitants of the country are faint hearted because of us. Now, verse one of chapter three, then Joshua rose early in the morning and they set out from Acacia Grove and came to the Jordan. He and all the children of Israel and lodged there before they crossed over. And again, that, that Jordan River is, is that divide. It's still the divide day between Israel and the nation Jordan next door. And again, he gets this confirmation. The Lord had told him already we're gonna get victory, but God's good to us. How oftentimes will he give us confirmation by two or three witnesses? And he gets up early to go. And they set out and then they set up. And just a small little note here. Look, there's a time to wait on the Lord indeed. And we wanna be a people who always first wait on the Lord and seek the Lord in prayer. But there's also a time to get up and go to work. And it always needs to be in that order. There's some people, they just want to get up and go and they never wait. That's problematic. There's other people, they just want to wait and they never want to get up and go. And that's problematic. I thought there of Isaiah 40, 31, we're familiar with it, <clears throat> but you see the order in here. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. And if you keep reading, their, their strength isn't renewed to wait more. Let's wait on the Lord so we get strength to wait more. no. Their strength's renewed and they shall mount up with wings like eagle and then they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not by faith uh, and and not faint. And really in a way they've been waiting around for 40 years. So it's time to get up and go now. And he gets this confirmation. So again, encourage you don't race ahead and don't sit around and just wait, 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 and then rise up and go when the Lord says rise up and go. Can we say amen to that? So it was after three days that the officers went through the camps and they commanded the people saying, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. I like that, go after it, get up and go. Yet there shall be a space between you and it about 2000 cubits. So that's what about uh, 3000 feet uh, by measure Do not come near it that you may know the way which you must go for you have not passed this way before. Now on the Ark of the Covenant was a seat and there were two cherubim, gold cherubim and that seat was called the mercy seat. And we read there, it's there in your notes but in Exodus 25, 22, the Lord said, that's where I'll meet with you. And when the high priest 
<coughs> would go in there to the tabernacle or the, and then the tabernacle later the temple, he would go in there and meet with the Lord and bring sacrifice for the sins of the nation to the Lord. And so really it, it, it wasn't them following the priest, but really they're following the priest who are following the word of the Lord and really going with the presence of the Lord. And that's a huge thing. You know, that's where victory is, is found. And victory would be found for the children of Israel in that. And I just put in my notes, you know, the priest handled the ark and the people would be commanded to follow the priest as they were following the Lord. And just a little side note here, because I know there's a lot of people that say, I don't follow anybody. Everyone follows somebody. They absolutely do. Some people just, they follow their own heart, and that could be at times the worst person to follow. But the question is, are you following those that are truly following the Lord? Because the people are getting commanded, when they go, you need to follow. And this is a biblical thing, and it's not a thing where we, people say, I don't follow men. Yeah, we don't follow men, but God has put men in places to lead, and absolutely, there is a charge to be under that leadership scripturally. I know those types of things are attacked in our rebellious world today, but that's absolute fact. Here's the thing in it though, are you following those truly following the Lord? First Corinthians 11, one Paul said, imitate me again, just as I imitate Christ. So as I follow the Lord, follow me. And it wasn't Paul saying, I'm the standard. Paul made it clear Jesus was the standard. And he says, follow me as I follow the Lord or imitate me as I imitate the Lord. So in that, that is, if I'm not following the Lord, don't follow me. And if I'm not imitating the Lord, don't imitate me. But I think more than ever, we need to make sure those that we're following, whether we're following them online or follow their podcast or we follow their books or we're in a local fellowship following that local leadership, it's imperative to know that they're following after the Lord. And I'm not gonna read the verses tonight because we've looked at it so many times, but there in 2 Peter 4, he's, or excuse me, 2 Timothy 4, we're called to preach the word. And then he says, the time will come where they won't endure salt sound doctrine, but what will they do? They'll heap up teachers and they'll turn their ears away from truth and be turned aside of fables. So it says teachers according to their own desires. So people even saying, I want to follow those that tell me what I want to hear and appeal to my fleshly desires and, you know, that really try to mix error with the word and we're going to even heap them up. Versus saying, I know that I'm called to really follow those things that are biblically, fundamentally sound. And praise God, those ministries still exist I think it's more and more of a remnant. But here's the thing, this idea of saying, well, you know what, they, they led us astray. There is an accountability for those who lead folks astray, but those who follow have an accountability as well of who they're following after. In fact, in the Old Testament, he talks about false prophets given, you know, and even to test the people. And so we want to make sure that the word of God is being rightly divided versus being mixed with opinion. You know, the Old Testament, there's a lot of things about not mixing, you know, seed, not mixing livestock. It talks about not li- mixing linen and wool. It's because the Lord had a prescribed manner for them to live according to his word. He wanted them to be set apart. And there were reasons for that as well, because if you mix linen and wool, you know what happens? Wool shrinks five times more than linen. You're gonna have a weird looking shirt. And there's a whole lot of people, they wanna mix opinion and, and psychology is a huge part of it with God's word. And then you start getting something that's Laodicean, which is hot and cold mixed together. And that's why those says, I vomit that out of my mouth. So I just encourage you, I encourage you because look at, we're, we're influenced by a lot of people. And in Christian, there's a lot of voices out there to really hold people to a high standard of God's word, which really, it's, it's a high standard, but that should be the standard, right? That should be clear. And, and there's just, there's just it, it, we, we have a tsunami of false teaching coming into Christian right now. Where, and and I, I'm not gonna rant, but just even just certain areas and sins that, it just seems like 
uh, uh, like all of a sudden we have to treat this sin differently than this sin and walk on eggshells and, when, and you know, uh, getting into all this psycho babble and stuff and it's not scriptural. And, and a lot, I think, times churches will even hear to it because it's gonna be popular in the short run. But I'll tell you, we, we, Christianity is not running a sprint, it's the long run. And as you stand in truth, that always serves you well in the long run, in ministry and in your life. So the other side of this is we're all leaders in some capacity and some more than others, but we need to make sure we are leading being led by the Lord. Men in your homes, I'm the leader. And you know, a guy, yeah, that's when even carnal men, they'll quote the Bible. I'm called to lead. You do what I say to do. You're called to follow the Lord, bro. And if you're not following the Lord, you're leading that family astray is what you're doing. Well, I'm a good guy. You know what? I do good things. I don't need Jesus. You need Jesus. I need Jesus. We're sinners. And so there's a great responsibility in that. Some verses in here about, you know what? judgment in those areas he also tells them to keep a space of three thousand feet between them and the priest and listen this is just practical you know when you tailgate somebody it's easy to have a fender bender right there is two million people following you know what we got to stop you need a little bit of space you know what otherwise we might have a trampling effect also, you ever follow someone, hey, follow me, we'll go over here. And then you tailgate them, and then all of a sudden, they turn without flipping on their blinker, and you're going straight, and they turn here. It's very practical. And the scripture is just full of practical truth, like if your, your, if your ax is dull, sharpen it. Wisdom, you know, it, 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 it's a great thing. On uh, our staff devotions this week, we're reading through 1 Corinthians, we got to chapter 14, and he talks about prophets and prophecies. And there's just a great order given there versus chaos and it's a practical order given to them, and yet there's just great wisdom in it. And I just love that about the scriptures, how practical it is, you know, it physically, in physical tasks, in mental tasks, in financial things, and in spiritual things. And it's just to be one of those, you know, something like that, just a great evidence, it's the Lord's hands in this. You give 3,000 feet so there's some room to move and so forth. Notice verse five, and Joshua said to the people, sanctify, or make holy yourselves, <clears throat> for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Well, that's exciting. Then Joshua spoke to the priest saying, take up the ark of the covenant and cross over before the people. So they took up the ark of the covenant and went before the people. Now again, sanctify yourself or make yourself holy before the Lord. Now these people were in covenant with God. Listen, they had put blood over their doorpost and had left Egypt. They're following the Lord. Now, positionally, they were holy the same way we were. They had faith in the living God. They had faith in the Messiah who was to come. Practically, though, obviously, there needed to be some sanctification. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been told to sanctify yourself. Look at they're east of the Jordan. A lot of these folks had picked up bad habits. They had got, you know, into, into uh, idolatry. They were practicing things that they should not have been practicing. No doubt, and we saw a few Sundays ago, or was this last Sunday, some of the shenanigans and, and the rebellions they got into. And we kind of saw the peak of it and God's correction in it, but no doubt, something doesn't peak out till a plague breaks out. We always, we all, we, we, those things usually start with a dabbling. And there is no doubt a dabbling of wickedness going on with many of these people. And he says, sanctify yourself, lay down your idols where you're making provision for sin, repent from it. Make a fresh commitment to walk with the Lord and do it. You're gonna see God do wondrous things. There's a lot of people that, oh, I never see God do anything. Yeah, you know what? Part of that is because of the way you live your life. You grieve the Holy Spirit every turn. Any chance to appease your carnal appetite, you're there first in line, you know, here we go. That quenches the Spirit of God. There's no power in that. There's no unction in that. God does not empower rebellion. Now listen, he's blessed by honesty though. Lord, I got this, I got this problem here. I wanna bring it to you. That's part of the sanctification. Wash me of it. God, help me with it. Versus, well, Jesus saves me, but I'm just gonna go out to the smorgasbord of the world and partake in this sin and that sin. And that's a lot of modern Christianity. A lot of that nonsense is being pushed you know, from pulpits today and so forth. That's not us. 
Listen, God's truth is for every generation and God has called this generation not to be legalistic, big difference between legalism and holiness, but he has absolutely called us to be holy, period. We are called to be a holy people, which means set apart. We're saved under good works. We're saved to walk in the law of liberty and empower an unction of the spirit of God to have fruits of the spirit in our life. Kind of what we're talking about in this. You walk by faith and you see God work in your life. Sanctify yourself, you're gonna see wonders. Notice what we're told in 1 Peter 1, 13. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, rest your hope fully upon the grace that's to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You're like, oh, I'm kind of hopeless tonight. Rest your hope in the coming of the Lord. That's what we're to rest our hope in. As obedient children, water break, not conforming yourself to the former lust. So it's not I'm saved, I'm gonna go conform myself to the things I used to walk in. He says, not doing that as, is your, as in your ignorance. It's, oh, st- come on, Steve, you're being legalistic. Listen, I'm not. Th- this is scriptural stuff. Legalism is when you start making up your own rules that aren't scriptural. When you start setting yourself as the standard. When you start adding to things for the gospel. Don't call holiness legalism, it's not. He says here, but as he who has called you is holy, you be holy, notice, in your conduct. Because it's written, be holy for I'm holy. And again, I'll tell you, that's where life's found. That's where liberty's found. That's where strength from upon high is found. And maybe you're in the place tonight where you're like, I want that. I got so many of these issues and struggles though. And look at, there's none of us that doesn't have sin that, that, that can easily beset us. But bring that before the, bring it in. You know, look at the chandelier, bring it into the light. Don't look at it too long, but bring it to the Lord. Say, God, I'm, I'm tired of living in the darkness here. I'm tired of calling this legalism. And let me tell you something about our culture today and cultures in times past. Generally, when, when, when the, in the church they begin to embrace um, lasciviousness and they want to call holiness a license to sin, pretty much anyone to the right of that at all or, or, or striving for holiness or, or trying to say, I want to walk in the law of liberty, they're, they're, the way they always attack is, oh, you're legalistic. You, you, you're religious. Look, to be religious means to, to have piety towards God. I'm religious. Absolutely, I'm religious. That's a glorious word. I mean, pure religion is to visit orphans and widows and keep oneself pure from the world. Read all that verse in James. That part always gets dropped off, you know, because it's a self, you know, we, we go help the poor and whatnot. Well, that's fine, but are you pure from the world? So just know that it's an attack. Oh, you're religious, but the real thing is they're the ones setting up a false religion. They're the ones doing that. Saying, oh, we have grace, so that gives us a license to go sin. And let's be like the world. That's not scriptural. That's a false religion. Well, we have a relationship, do you? Because I know that lifestyle quenches the work of the Holy Spirit of God. What kind of relationship do you have with the Lord? It sounds like maybe you and a made-up Jesus, and I think people could even be saved and have a side Jesus, so to speak that just appeases them in their pursuits. So he tells them next year, says to the priest, take up the Ark of the Covenant, cross before the people. I love it. They took it up and went before the people. And God's in charge of all of this and all of us have orders to follow. It's not just people in the pews. It's even more so pastors. And in this case, Levitical priest. And we wanna remember that when we're, if we get in that core mode of, hey, I'm gonna strive and I'm gonna take over this leadership. You know, and if, if God's calling you to lead, he'll put you in that place. But if you strive for it, I'm gonna go lead. You can only lead if you're following the Lord. Otherwise, you're gonna, you're gonna be the blind leading the blind. And there's a harsh judgment in that. And God, people like, I'm gonna go lead. Look, you're gonna follow more if you're ever gonna lead. There's a whole lot more following done if you're leading people in the Lord than if you're even following people leading in the Lord. Does that make sense? I mean, you you gotta be led, your aim needs to be, I gotta be led in everything. We can't cut corners here. You cut corners, you get burned, you get chastened real quick. God takes it seriously. Verse seven, we're still in chapter three, oh my goodness. 
And the Lord said to Joshua, this day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. So you shall command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, when you come to the edge of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. Moses, or Joshua was a humble man. Moses was a humble man. We know the scripture says, if you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, he'll exalt you in due time. He'd been assistant for a long time. He'd been Moses' sidekick, Moses' water boy for all those years, you could say. But he did it humbly, and he did it joyfully. And you never saw him strive and say, I gotta get this Moses out of the way. It's my time to lead. No, he followed the Lord with a humble heart. And now God's exalting him, and he's exalting him for a purpose. Look at self-exaltation glorifies men and leads men astray from God and unto man. But when God exalts men and women, it's a purpose to glorify God and lead people to God and man. And it was time for Joshua to be exalted for that. And I'll tell you, when he puts you in that place, then you can lead with authority because he starts commanding. I'm commanding you guys, it's time to go. And look at this wasn't against some guy trying to muster up a following. He was saying this in the power of the Lord. Big difference between the two. Verse nine, so Joshua said to the children of Israel, <coughs> didn't cough, but come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, by this you shall know that the living God is among you, that he will without fail, I love it, Drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Gershites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Notice how he starts it. Come hear the word of the Lord. He goes, this ain't my word. You don't need my word. I'm gonna give you the word of the Lord. Word of the Lord's powerful. You can hang your hat on the word of the Lord. Look, at we gotta go back to the word of God. That's something you have to choose to come to and you gotta choose to hear. You'll be nourished. You'll be instructed. You'll be encouraged and you'll get the words of eternal life. I think about the disciples when everyone, the big masses left Jesus because he said, look at the soup kitchen's closed. Now it's time to put faith in me. And they all went and left. And he says to your disciples, are you gonna leave too? And they said, there's nowhere else to go. You have the words of eternal life. That's true to this day. Here's the word of the Lord. And he says, you shall know the living God is among you. Why? because you're gonna see the living God doing living things. That's how you're gonna know. Look, it's a glorious thing when you take in God's word and believe in the living God, you will see God doing things and it's glorious. It's awesome, it's encouraging. And it's not that we're seeking after things and we don't wanna be sign seekers, but it just comes with walking with the Lord. I think a lot of it is your eyes are just able to see. And in, in there's life there and you go, oh, I can see God working in that. Where before, when you're not heeding God's word, God's even doing things that could be seen, but you can't see it at all. We know scripturally in Mark 16, he says, these signs will follow those who believe in me. And then he lists you know, several things here, but it starts by believing him, believing his word and seeking him first. And so we see the pattern throughout scripture. And he says, I'm without fail gonna drive out these nations, and again, oh boy, God's evil. He's driving out the Canaanites. These guys were warned hundreds of years earlier. They had the witness of the gospel brought to them hundreds of years earlier. They were in idolatry. They, for the most part, denied God, and they had a knowledge of God. They had a knowledge of the coming Messiah, Savior of the world. Their sin increased they finally came to the point where their sin reached heaven and they were gonna be judged. And I share this all the time, it goes back. They were no longer ashamed of their sin. They had pride parades about their sin. Oh, listen, let's have a parade and be pride about this sin. And this sin over here, you know, because sin just keeps growing. There's just more and more. It never stops, just so you know. When you got sinful agendas and people say, just give us a little bit. It doesn't stop. Leaven doesn't stop, but just keeps growing and growing and growing until it's crucified at the cross of Calvary. And th this was a wicked, wicked people that offered their children to demons that practiced gross sexual immorality. Th th this was a dark, dark world. And God had, don't read this for a second and go, oh God, so, God had been so gracious with these people. But eventually the clock runs out on everybody. And go read the history books. Every nation eventually falls. 
And generally when they fall, it's right before it. You know what it is? They're no longer ashamed of sin. In fact, they even try to shame people to go, wait a minute, that's sinful. That's harmful. That's destroying children. Boo, shut up, you fundamentalist. You know what, you, you uh, uh, bigot and this and that. Don't be ashamed of God or his word in the midst of a wicked and perverse generation, especially one that he saved us out of, amen? And so the judgment was coming upon them and God says, you're gonna see me go before you and you're gonna see me slay giants because these, these nations were littered with giants. We'll get into that at some point here again down the road. <clears throat> Verse 11, he says, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord of the earth is crossing before you into the Jordan. Look at, he's saying, behold, the Lord of the earth is going before you. Trust and obey. Let me ask you, is he your Lord tonight? Can you say amen to that? Amen. Well, then the Lord of all the earth is going before you. Trust and obey. That's good reason to be strong and courageous. Now, therefore, take for yourselves 12 men from the 12 tribes, one from each tribe, and it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth. I love how he's just putting all these little encouragements in. Jesus, the Lord of all the earth <clears throat> shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, the waters shall come down from upstream, and they shall stand up as a heap. So in other words, they're gonna step out of faith and you're gonna see God move. He doesn't say, you know what, it's gonna happen and then you step. He says you step and then it's going to happen. A lot of people say, oh, you know what? I never see God do anything. Yeah, you never take any steps of faith. Well, I might fail. I would rather be Peter any day, three steps on the water and sink and have Jesus throw me in the boat than just sit here on the side. Well, you know what? I can tell you 10 reasons why I shouldn't take a step of faith. That's why it's called a step of faith. <laughs> we talked about it, was it Sunday or the week before? I can't remember where people say, oh, I can't sow seed, it's windy. I can't sow seed, it might rain. You can always find a reason not to take a step of faith and be obedient to the Lord. But I'll tell you, when you take steps of faith, and we're gonna step out and we're gonna trust in the Lord, you see the Lord work, and you can also know God's gonna pick me up when I fall, because sometimes when you step, you fall on your face. But better to step and fall on your face than just to sit in the peanut gallery and go, well, I don't think so today. Verse 14. So it was when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And those who bore the Ark came to the Jordan and the feet of the priests who bore the Ark dipped in the edge of the water. This is good here. For the Jordan overflows all its bank during the whole time of harvest that the waters which came from upstream stood still and rose in a very heap far away from the, uh, at Adam the city that is uh, besides Zeratan. So the waters went down to the sea to uh, Arabah. The salt sea, or the dead sea as we know it now, failed and were cut off. And the people crossed over opposite Jericho. So can you imagine being in Jericho and all of a sudden you see the waters of Jordan go up and your heart's already melted? Trip out on that. Then the priest who bore the Ark of the Covenant Underline, I got underlined, stood firm on dry ground. Stood firm on dry ground. And the midst of the Jordan, all Israel crossed over on dry ground until all the people had crossed completely over the Jordan. Now again, the river was overflowing, then it stood up like a wall on both sides. God is not subjected to the laws of the universe that he set in place. This is called a miracle. And I believe this is even tacked on. It was overflowing from, you know, the wise, learned historian. And sometimes it's the Christian historian that we're going to explain how this can happen. And, you know, like we talked about the Red Sea. You know, there's a little narrow patch. And if you walk on it just right, you can get across the thing. God's doing a miracle here. He's a God of miracles. You can be between the rock and a hard place. And God can open up the sea, bring you through, and even drown your enemy chasing you. The God of all the earth, that's who we say we, we serve. Get that in your heart tonight. The enemy doesn't want you to believe in that. He, he wants us to limit God and not to have a full faith in God. Nothing's impossible with the Lord. And I love all these details because it explains the way all that. No, I get annoyed by that. You know, you know, a Christian documentary on how they crossed the Red Sea and I got this little patch of ground. Get out of here with that. Share it a Sunday. How do the Egyptians then drown then in two feet of water? Come on. It's overflowing. It's like God says, let's just get, let's go at the time of the spring when it's overflowing. Again, the snow's melting from Mount Hermon. 
It's bursting. And that's, that river was a lot bigger back then than it is now. And I love it. Listen, stepping out of faith can feel risky, can it? Especially to the flesh. But it's the most solid ground you can ever walk on. Because he stepped out of faith and he stood firm on the dry ground. And I love it. Everyone who followed crossed over on dry land successfully. God doesn't lose one of his sheep ever. We want to hear his voice and follow. Chapter four. And it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan that the Lord spoke to Joshua saying, take for yourself 12 men from the people, one man from every tribe and command them saying, take for yourself 12 stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan from the place where the priest's feet stood, stood firm and you shall carry them w- uh, over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. That'd be Gilgal that's several times in the word. Um, again, I love how it's reiterated. They all crossed over and it's reiterated as well on dry ground and the priest's feet stood firm. That's not by chance it's reiterated. It's God saying, step out of faith and watch how solid the ground is you walk on. Watch how, oh, it seems kind of shaky. No, it's, it's solid ground. And the more you just see God go before you, the more solid the ground gets. It's always the case. Again, remember, they're heeding the word of God. As so he's get 12 men and tell stones, he doesn't tell them quite, uh, quite yet what it's for. They'll get the revelation soon and our time short. Sometimes God calls us to do things. Well, I don't know quite, quite how, you know, why, but time short, eventually you're gonna find out. So it's, you know, an exercise of patience on our behalf. And again, in the next few verses, we're going to find out well, but it'd be easy to complain. You know what? You're, you're, you're trudging through the river and now I got to carry a big old stone too. I don't want to do this, God. I, I don't want to bear this burden. Let someone else get it. But when you always bear a burden that you're called to bear by the Lord, there's always a blessing coming. It's always the case. Verse four, then Joshua called the 12 men who he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, cross over before the ark of the Lord your God in the midst of the Jordan. Each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come saying, what do these stones mean to you? And you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it crossed over the Jordan and the waters of the Jordan were cut off and all the stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. So again, th- this would be for a memorial. Gilgal means circle of stones. A memorial that they could point their children to as a teaching object to say, those stones are from that Jordan. We were in that wilderness for 40 years and God split it and we walked through. And so we wanna show you the power and the awesomeness of God. We wanna show you that God led us to where we are and everything we have here are, is because of God's blessing. And notice who's it mainly for? It's for the children. The Lord's concerned about children. Again, Jesus said, suffer the little children to come to me. Now notice verse eight. When the children did so, just as Joshua commanded and took up 12 stones from the midst of the Jordan, as the Lord has spoken to Joshua according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel and carried them with them over to the place where they had lodged and laid them down there. Then Joshua set up the 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan in the place where the feet of the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant stood, and they lay there to this day. Now here's the thing, the stones were there to that day, and Joshua, you know, most likely is is pinning this at the end of his life. The sad thing about it is this, if you go read Judges 2, and you can read it here, Judges 2, it's there in 7 through 10, It says, when Joshua passed away, the next generation, it says that, in fact, verse 10, it says, when all that generation had gathered to their fathers, Judges 2, 10, another generation rose after them, notice, who did not know the Lord nor walk, uh, nor nor the work that he had done for Israel. The memorial was set up, they they were obedient in that, where they were disobedient is they failed to tell their kids why that was there. How tragic, how tragic to see all that victory, to to have God's word, 
for God to say, build this so you can tell your kids why it's there so they would know the power of the Lord. They had all the tools there and they didn't exercise them. I think it's so tragic. There's so much tragedy in our world today. You know what, again, it, it's, it's a world that's getting more and more marked by deception, but here's the thing, there's still so many, we have all the resources we need today. We got Bibles in our homes. There are still good churches that preach the word, that have great Sunday school programs and midweek programs and such. We have testimonies of what God's done in our lives. We have everything we need to sow into our kids and then there's so many people that don't do that. They think, well, God worked in me and you know what, we'll, we'll, we're gonna, we're gonna, I remember, I'll never forget it, this one guy I coached with and, and he said he was a Christian and he really seemed to understand the gospel. And I said, I'll say, bro, I don't wanna use his name. I go, you need to get your kids in church. I know I was raised in church and it sounded like it was a God-fearing church. But you know what? My daughter went to Christian preschool and we do sports in the weekend. Now again, there can be a place for sports here and there, whatever. If you do that all the more, you better be Wednesday night. Well, they get up early on Thursday. Dude, my kids like, my kids dragged to school on Thursdays for 18 years of every single one of their lives. Well, I'll be tired. I don't care. God will strengthen you. And they even go, I'm like, because my kids like ran, they like, I don't know if you you guys around where Elijah's little boy, this little fat butterball, he'd be beet red, sweaty. They'd be wrestling the whole time, you know. What'd you learn? He'd tell me what they learned. Same with the girls. I remember Gracie would run through and there'd be a trail of kids behind her and so forth. I don't care if you're tired tomorrow. You need God's word. You need a supplement to what you're getting at home. You need to hear it more than from, from your dad and your mom. And yet tragedy, how how often, oh, they go off to college and they lose their faith. That shouldn't be the case. Those guys are knuckleheads at those colleges. They're easy to defeat and debate. What they put forth is, is massive, it's stupidity. You're seeing the fruit of it in our world today. That, that's all from the colleges, just so you know. Not all of them, but the bulk of them. With a... With a a conspiracy, an effort to try to destroy our nation on top of that. Oh, aren't we learned we came from monkeys? Bro, there ain't a shred of evidence for that's one of the stupidest things in the world and people put it out like it's great knowledge. We can't equip our kids to be able to like, check that? That should be checked. Oh, but he used some big words. Bro, you can't, information doesn't just appear. Life only comes from life. I'll, I'm gonna start to rant. <laughs> I can't encourage you enough. Look, if I could go, you know, you go, oh man, if I can go back, what would I do? I'd put more of God's word on my kids, in my kids' hearts. I would put more of it in, more of it in. I look and I go, man, I should have did more. And then I look at, we even me and my wife, where we were when we met, we were like, we, we were, we met and within a year I was a youth pastor. Within two and a half years, I was a pastor of this church. We knew the Lord, but both of us were kind of train wrecked. We were train wrecked, man. I mean, you, you, I haven't shared my testimony in a long time and she hasn't shared hers, but they're, it's messy. It is messy on so many levels. And I look, man, I should have did this. I, I was like, I was a child myself in the Lord, pastoring a church. And God was so gracious because no one wanted to pastor this church. So it was the perfect church for me to pastor. <laughs> Serious. First Sunday I taught her, there were 15 people. No one wanted to even come to it. And luckily, because I, I would, could, could muster up a Bible study with some youth kids and we had about 30 chairs on Sunday. So I put a basketball hoop up there for a youth group and we'd play jungle ball. And I'd say, bring your friends and I'll bring, bring your friends. I'll beat any of them in wrestling. I like, after Bible study, be beating the tar out of these kids and they loved it. A lot of them didn't have dads. And the youth group just grew and grew and grew. It was like five times bigger than the congregation. 
And so I'm out with God that, and I was a Christian. I mean, it gets worse. You think a puppet's bad. I used to do Christian rap. <laughs> and we were just barely, we didn't know anything. I would say, if I got a time machine, I'd go back to talk to young Steve. Oh, man. And so what I try to do is now is, what if 80-year-old Steve could come talk to me now? That's what I try to do now. But my point in, as I look and, and I just pray, Lord, water all the seeds that were planted in my kids' hearts. Because even when you plant the seeds in the heart, it is a wicked, cruel world. You're like, oh, I, my kids, they're not gonna stumble anything. You need to crucify that prideful heart. And I can't encourage you enough. I'll plead with you, put more of God's word in their heart. Well, how do I do that? Open a, open a chapter, pray, read it. Let everyone pick a favorite verse and then talk about it for a few minutes. Amazing what that will do. Amazing what it will do. These guys didn't do it. The next, gen, they saw all this awesomeness in the next generation. They didn't know the Lord. And that will be more down the road, but verse 10, so the priest who bore the ark stood in the midst of the Jordan. I got five minutes and I'm gonna finish until, until everything was finished that the Lord had commanded Joshua to speak to the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua. I love it. We're gonna cover all of it. We're gonna follow the word. And the people hurried and crossed over. Then it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over that the ark of the Lord <clears throat> and the priest crossed in the presence of the people. And I love it. Until everything was finished, then the priest said, okay, we completely, we completed the task. Let's be task completers. God honors it greatly. Verse 12, and the men of Reuben, the men of Gab, the half tribe of Manasseh crossed over, armed before the children of Israel as Moses had spoken to them. This is crazy, about just two and a half tribes, about 40,000 prepared for war crossed over before, before the Lord for battle. And the plains of Jericho, on the plains of Jericho, on that day the Lord exalted Joshua to fight all of Israel, uh, and, and, excuse me, uh, in the sight of all of Israel, and they feared him as they feared Moses all the days of his life. I don't know if that's good or bad because they didn't have a lot of respect for Moses, but anyway. <laughs> I love it though that this two and a half tribes, they kept, they kept their word. And it'd been so easy for them to welch. Well, you know what, you know, we, we're gonna get up and we have some barn raisings first over at the tribe of Gad. Well, we'll get over there, but you know, we've established schools here and I'm coaching ball or whatever. You know what? So many reasons, so many excuses, but they said, you know, we need to keep our word. Arm up 40,000, we're going over with you. It's a glorious thing. And it's a glorious thing because how often, especially nowadays, it used to be a man's word, you know, it was, was you know, it, it had to do with this person and character. So many people welch on their word today. I encourage you to read Psalm 15. It says, the Lord uh, who may, who, uh, the Lord who may, abide, who may abide in your tabernacle, who may dwell in your holy hill. And he lists a whole list of things. And he says here at the end of verse four, he who swears to his own hurt and does not change it. I know there's sometimes when, when things come up that are out of our control, not talking about a legalism here, but how many times do we say, I'm gonna do it? And like, oh, that's gonna hurt. Let me find a way out. God says, I take pleasure when you keep your word to the point that it hurts. And I'll tell you, when you do that, and you're like, oh man, you know, how, why'd I commit to this? Ever been there before? What'd I get myself into here? If you're supposed to be out, God will give you a way out at the right time. But no, I'm going to do it till my hurt. I'm gonna do it even to my own hurt. It says there, the last verse, he who does these things shall never be moved. God honors that. Look, I've seen men's entire lives change when they got saved. And I just said, bro, you're a total flake. You never keep your word. I, I can be straight up in counseling too. No one trusts you. I remember one brother, I said, if you just start keeping your word, your life will entirely change. This guy's life's entirely different now. I mean, entirely different. And he shines for the Lord. I mean, a dude who was a criminal now ministers to criminals professionally in a prison. They just let him say whatever he wants because the people are so messed up. And he just talks about, he gets paid to talk to these guys about the Lord all day. And before, this is one of the most flaky guys I've ever met. I want to wring his neck so many times when like he was supposed to come do something. Where is this guy at? I didn't wring his neck, but I wanted to. And God forgave me for wanting to. Anyhow, so they all cross over. And again, the Lord establishes Joshua. 
Verse 15, then the Lord spoke to Joshua saying, command the priests who bear the ark of the testimony to come up from the Jordan. Joshua therefore commanded the priests saying, come up from the Jordan. And it came to pass when the priests who bore the ark of the covenant had come up from the midst of the Jordan, the soles of the priests' feet touched the dry land and the waters of the Jordan returned to the place and overflowed all its banks. And listen, they stepped in, the, the water split, they stepped out, they came back. I, I really believe it's just a small picture of how the Lord wants to, we're kings and priests in Christ. When we step into things, that there should be a noticeable difference because the Lord's with us. And sometimes we get driven out of things. Sometimes we're told to step away. And I see many situations over the day where either Christians are called to step away or sometimes they just abandon their posts. And where there was light, all of a sudden it becomes darkness. And so let's be led of the Lord and where we step and when we're supposed to step in and away. Now the people came up from the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month and they camped in Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And so they're over the Jordan now, they're right outside Jericho. And the 12 stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua said, set up in Gilgal. And he spoke to the children of Israel saying, when your children ask their fathers in time to come saying, what are these stones? Then you shall let your children know saying, Israel crossed over this Jordan on dry land for the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had all crossed over. As the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had all crossed over, that the peoples of the earth may know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. And so it's reiterated again, tell this to your kids. And they would fail except for a small group of folks. I know Joshua said, me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord. But many of them failed in it. But notice it wasn't just for Israel and their children, but this was also for all the peoples of the world. And even part of that bondage and all these difficulties was God setting the stage so the world would see God move in a mighty, marvelous, huge way because it was one of the ways that, you know what, even more so back then without the printed word that he would communicate who he was to these people like to little Rahab. I mean, she, she had no witness of the Lord at that point, but something awesome had happened there after all that slavery that got, got all the way there in this house of prostitute that most likely she was raised in, that there's a God of heaven who split the Red Sea. And then he drowned the Egyptian armies and he gave victory and it just resonated in her. God's still calling people to himself. Amen. Let's pray for folks and lift them up. Man, we made it. Heavenly Father, we bless you. We just thank you for this evening. Thank you for your word, God. It's so good. I just thank you that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, we're not reading about the Old Testament, God. This is God. This is New Testament, God. This is who you are. You are good. You are powerful. You're wanting to see men saved. You have mercy and compassion. Lord, you're so long-suffering. We thank you for that. And Lord, I know you're wanting to bless your people, and you're blessed when we step out of faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please you. And so help us to be found of people doing that. And even all the more, Lord, I hope we've been stirred, God, to sow your word into our kids, our grandkids. God, to, to be sowing your word into the children of this church, that those ministries would never, you know, become unimportant, but always be of high importance, God. And uh, thank you for so many folks that share in those ministries, Lord. And even folks that just pray for those ministries. They can't do a lot, but they just pray and their prayers are powerful. Hey, if you're here tonight and you haven't called upon Christ, Jesus is the answer. We're sinners, we're under condemnation, but Christ came and he, he bore the wrath to us and he, he laid down his life for me and you and he took it back up to defeat sin and death. And the scripture says, whoever will call on his name will be saved. If you haven't called on him, let him meet you where you're at. Let this God that we've talked about tonight, the God, the only God, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, let him do a work in your life and it starts by you yielding to him and saying, God, forgive me, be my Lord. Lord, any of that place, bless them where they are. Just bless our fellowship right now and we pray these things in Jesus' name we said together, amen. amen. God bless you.